Good evening. Today is May 2nd, 2014. My name is Matthew Ogden, and you're joining us for our weekly webcast uh, on LaRouchePack.com. I'm joined in the studio by Benjamin Dennison tonight from the LaRouche Pack basement team, and as usual, Mr. Lyndon LaRouche. Now, I have a question to begin tonight's broadcast with, which is coming in from an institutional contact. Uh, and the question reads as follows. Mr. LaRouche, this week, the White House, after stalling for more than a year, released a large number of documents on the Benghazi attack of September 11, 2012. Among those documents was a damning memo from President Obama's national security speechwriter, Ben Rhodes, to other White House and National Security Council staff confirming that Susan Rice's appearance on television was scripted by the White House to cover up political errors and put out a false story about spontaneous protests being the cause of the attack that killed Ambassador Christopher Stevens and three other American diplomats. The memo strongly suggests that the administration sought to save its skin by betraying the public trust and lyingly knowing and lying knowingly to the American people and to Congress. And now the breaking news on this is that House Speaker John Boehner has just announced that a special select committee to investigate Benghazi will be formed and that a subpoena has been issued for John Kerry to testify. So the question is, can you please tell us what the political and constitutional implications are of these new revelations. We've got a process going on internationally. And it really says that we're getting closer and closer to the day that uh, our current president is thrown out of office. Uh, with what penalties attached to that, we don't yet know. But nonetheless, it's happening. <coughs> Uh, and it, the way events actually work in history is that you, you cannot predict from a series of events what the events will be. What you can actually determine is by looking at the overall process with which the events are occurring, you can see how the overall process of events will bring the, say, the uh, malefactor uh, to justice, which, which means you don't know the date on the basis of looking at the malefactor. You look at the you look you can locate the nature of the uh, case and the result by looking at exactly what the context of a whole the whole process is. Now this is going to be global because it's going to be what's happening in Russia right now, what's happening in Ukraine right now, what Mrs. Merkel's visit is going to run into because of this jerk called a president. Mm -hmm. She's, she's just walking in there to do what she wants to do, which is a really reasonable thing. He is going to be nasty about it, and that will probably sink him down still lower. But the larger thing is the larger process on a global scale is now converging on a little thing like the, the president's behavior. And it's not the president's behavior that's going to bring him down. It's the total environment within his, which his behavior is being directed. So if people want to know what, when and what is going to happen, you cannot tell that by looking at this guy or to, by taking a particular event or a couple of events around him. That is not what's going to determine what's going to happen. You have to look at the entire process. For example, what's happening in Russia? What's happening in Germany? What's happening in China? These, these factors all come together over a period of time and they converge on a result. And only by studying the process of convergence can you see all the factors which are going to determine the estimated timing of the event and the outcome of the event. Now, the point is that what can happen to this president, can, he can be thrown out of office at any time. For example, even that case, even what Boehner moved on, that would be enough to throw him out of the presidency. Now, it also means that other things are happening in the same connection. Uh, that what is happening now is bringing great pressure to the Republican Party, which has been trying to play one game 
will now, under these events, will find itself being moved almost magically into a position contrary to what it wanted. It wanted to be the Republican Victory Party of the next election. And that, that's going to be in disturbed highly by these kinds of processes. So you just have to take the total picture. Uh, that is an historical picture, at least approximately near time historical, and you can begin to see how the process will unfold. You cannot predict an event. You can locate the process and look at the factors of timing, which will determine what the effect might be. Well, in addition to the cover-up ongoing about the Benghazi story uh, and the ongoing cover-up concerning 9-11, the 28 pages and the documents in possession by the FBI in Florida, uh, there is another cover-up which is still in process but is on the verge of being broken open also. And this concerns a new documentary film that has been released several years ago but is now gaining circulation uh, in the English language audience titled Unlawful Killing on the subject of the uh, role of the British Crown and MI6 in the murder of Princess Diana. Uh, while this film reviews long-standing evidence about the crash that occurred in Paris in August of 1997, the documentary breaks new ground by focusing on the role of Prince Philip in ordering Diana's murder and prominently features the now well-known quote of Prince Philip declaring that he hopes to be reincarnated as a deadly virus to deal with the population reduction issue. And uh, a major segment of the film focuses on Prince Philip's Nazi pedigree, including his education at a Nazi-sponsored private school when he was young, and the fact that two of his sisters married SS officers. And uh, the film shows a photograph of young Prince Philip marching in a funeral parade for a prominent Nazi party leader next to his two brothers-in-law, both dressed in Nazi uniforms. Now, one crucial piece of evidence that the film focuses on, uh, which was suppressed during the official royal coroner's inquest, was a letter from October of 1993 that was written by Princess Diana to a close friend of hers, uh, which said that her husband was plotting to have her killed in an automobile accident caused by, quote, brake failure or some other tampering. And the letter in Diana's original handwriting is shown on the screen several times throughout the film, in addition to a number of close friends of Diana's being interviewed who corroborate that she indeed feared for her life from both Prince Charles and Prince Philip. Um, at one point, after she began seeing Dodi Fayed, Diana received a threatening call personally from Prince Philip. Um, now, the documentary uh, covers several new uh, items that have to do with what occurred around the crash, that it indeed was not paparazzi, but that there was a a uh, bright light that was shown, a blinding light that was shown um, to engineer the vehicular attack. And the uh, royal inquest, in fact, did find that this was not an accident, but, quote, an unlawful killing. And that the blood tests on Henri Paul, the driver of the car, were so contradictory that uh, they could not be served as the basis for concluding that he was, as the cover story claimed, drunk at the time. So there are pending legal actions in both Britain and France still to this day that have been brought by Mohammed Al-Fayed. And uh, he's prominently featured in the documentary asserting his continued strong belief that it was Prince Philip who ordered Diana's assassination. 
So this film is being now belatedly circulated three years after being suppressed in many parts of the English-speaking world. And so we can expect uh, more impact from this in the coming period. Now, just what I said before, same thing. How does history work? These things go way back, actually. This, this event was an event in and of itself, but it was a part of a process. Why did it come into, into being at this time? How does that work? Well, the process of events as such, in other words, the history enabled them to keep the thing under suppression. The evidence was there, but it was not popularly circulated. And, and people did not tend to wish to believe it. Ah, and the important thing about human behavior is the wish to believe. That this is the trickiest thing in the whole business, the wish to believe. People are not moved by events. They're moved by the wish to believe in those events or to believe in an interpretation of those events under those circumstances in the process of history. History is a long process. For example, the history of, of our civilization is about a thousand years long. It's in that direction. It starts essentially in the Renaissance, when the, when the Renaissance created a new co course of history in, the, in the, uh, the Renaissance movement. It created science. Science was created in that period by the, French, by the Renaissance. All, all competent science and European science came from the Renaissance. In the case of Kepler, Kepler's discovery of the solar system. Nobody had ever known the existence of a solar system until Kepler discovered it. All competent science, in terms of modern science, has depended on a, on a structure of Kepler's discovery of the solar system. S similarly, then you have other developments, the role of Leibniz. Leibniz took what had come from those processes and made a package of it, in a sense, a package of development. That shaped history. Then you came to a new point in history in, in, in physical science, at the beginning of the 19th century, with Kepler, uh, with Kepler, but others at the same time. And then we had a process. It came to the end of the 20th, to the beginning of the 20th century. And by that time, a world war had come into being. At the same time, the idea of science was destroyed systemically on the, around the world. No longer was science used. Deduction was used. Mathematics was used, not physics. So the, the, this process of canceling of the use of science or suppressing it gradually into a point of crossing it. Most, for example, most scientists today are incompetent. Why? Because they're not scientists. So the, uh, the, uh, what happened then? Well, you have the killing of, of uh, John F. Kennedy. What happened with John F. Kennedy? Well, from that point, the whole U.S. economy has ever since that time, since the death of Kennedy and the beginning of that war in Indochina, which is a terrible mistake, a willful mistake, but the killing of Kennedy was done to allow them to get the war in Indochina going, to start the drug pushing process and all these other things that have gone on. So now you've got, a, you've got a process of degeneration. And we use uh, degeneration sometimes means generations. Mm -hmm. Because we have children today in, who are under the most recent two presidencies. And the young child, the children today do not have intellectual capabilities that their parents had. And they, in turn, have lower intellectual capabilities than their grandparents did. So, the, the, so these, these factors, now we, we have great expenditures of money by Wall Street, but the people who work aren't working anymore. The people who, who are employed aren't paid anymore. Recently, there's been a cancellation of all support. The world is operating under the British monarchy's policy of genocide. 
The policy was to reduce the human species, the Queen's directive, from 7 million people, approximately, to less than one. What we're having in fracking in the United States is genocide. It's a part of the genocide process. What's happening in Texas, what is not done in Texas as well. What's happening with all our policies under, under these most recent presidents. These are all, so what happens, you come to a point where the whole system is about to go into a crisis. And you have a shift now which is occurring where the shift is away from the transatlantic region and the shift of progress is moving toward the Pacific region. It's going from Russia all the way to the Pacific. That's where progress still exists. So therefore you have this entire period which is a homogeneous period in which you can, you can forecast history by taking all the things that are occurring in the process of history and see how the evolution of behavior occurs. Why did this thing come out about her, or the Adonicus? Adonicus? It came out because the time was right. Not because there was some magic power to it, but now the British Empire is a failure. It's disintegrating. It's hated. And therefore, suddenly, the great British Empire, people all admired this great empire. They praised the Queen. They praised all these other guys. Today, they're going in a different direction. What determined that? Popular opinion? Not really popular opinion. Because people think that they think independently. They say, my opinion. Well, it's not really their opinion. Very few people have honestly their own opinion. The opinion they have is one that's shoved down their, their back of their neck and they don't even know it's there. But they find themselves believing one guy to the next, saying, we believe, we believe. Why do these dummies believe anything at all? Because the course of events have pushed them into believing it and reacting accordingly. And the complex of events is what shapes these things. And that's where we are now. And that's why I have a certain amount of confidence about what the future of mankind might turn out to be. Well, let me ask a question about this um, reorientation towards the Pacific. Uh, concerning Russia, and events today are very dramatic. There was a uh, 40 people, 38 people have been killed uh, from fire that was set by right sector fascist thugs in Odessa at the Trade Union Hall. There's a major offensive going on in eastern Ukraine in Slovyansk. Uh, this question concerns recent proposals that have been made by Sergei Glaziev uh, for the de-offshoreization of the Russian economy. Now, last week, you called the bluff of those in Europe and in the West who are attempting to intimidate Russia into conceding to their demands with threats of financial warfare and military action, while in fact it's the transatlantic system which is hopelessly bankrupt. Uh, the point you made is that relative to Western Europe, Russian banks and the Russian economy is far less fragile and is relatively in a better position, uh, that with the bankruptcy at an accelerating rate in Europe, the bail-in process now going forward, uh, it's not a question of who's on top, but you said Russia is in a better position to defend itself than any part of continental Western Europe. The British system's not secure, the New York City system's not secure, uh, and that Russia has a strong position in terms of uh, relative economic security. And so if somebody tries to blackmail them by a European operation, you said it will be Europe that will go down because the European system is much more fragile than the Russian economy. So you've got now this week articles appearing in the European press, you know, asking the question, is Deutsche Bank the next Lehman Brothers? Um, the transatlantic financial system is now adopting a bail-in regime. 
And at this time, you have now top advisors of President Putin in the Russian government stating that the sanctions that Obama is levying against the Russian economy will hurt the West far more than they will affect Russia. And uh, certain leading Russian economists are now using this as an opportunity to move forward with this de-offshoreization of the Russian economy, as they call it. In other words, reversing the enforced deadly economic liberalization that Russia was subjected to after the collapse of the Soviet Union, when it was made into a raw materials importer or exporter dependent on one London and Wall Street speculation, uh, rather than adopting an internal development high technology policy driven by sovereign credit generation. So this proposal uh, by academician Sergei Glaziev, who is a very close uh, advisor to President Putin, was put forward in a 15-point plan in which he suggests a series of measures that Russia undertake to transfer its assets and accounts away from NATO countries, um, to sell off government bonds in NATO countries, to adopt currency controls on speculative transactions. Uh, some of the major aspects of this are to uh, switch accounts within the Belarus-Kazakhstan-Russian Customs Union uh, into national currencies, and especially to set up currency and credit swap agreements with China. And Putin is on his way to China in the coming weeks. Now, what Glaziev proposes is that Russia, quote, find new potential sources of long-term and inexpensive internal credit, proposing that the domestic credit availability be doubled or even tripled with uh, dirigist-style credit issuances from the Russian Central Bank for earmarked specific projects. So this is consistent with the program that Glaziev has advocated for years to revive the national economy in Russia, going all the way back to hearings that he sponsored in the Russian Duma, in which you, Mr. LaRouche, were invited as the key witness. So I would like to give you a chance to comment on well, this. Well, Glaziev was a key figure uh, and, uh, and closely associated with a, another friend of mine in Russia. And Glaz I've known Glaziev for this long period of time since then and follow his career. I haven't been in touch with him directly recently, but I, I know the man. I was once, one, I was once a, uh, an endorser of his candidacy for election in, to presidency in, in Russia. And he's a very capable fellow. And his circles he is associated with are also very capable people. Now, but as to what, what this all means, I think the best way to do is, is to take a case which illustrates what the significance of what he is, Glaziev is saying. All right, now look at the United States. And if you look at the U.S. currency, and you look at the actual incomes, physical incomes, that people in the United States receive as, as income for work, for work, not for speculation. The amount of speculation in the United States is tremendous. We are starving our people. We have been destroying the people of the United States, and yet they are being charged great fees for something that nobody else earned. In other words, Wall Street and similar institutions are robbing the American people, and they, they are taking the money away from the people, charging the people with the money which they are stealing and, and creating artificially. Now, if we, well, Glass-Steagall, for example, put Glass-Steagall into work immediately, and that's, that's not the best, that's one way of doing it, but there's another one that's more important, more relevant to us all. If we cancel Wall Street money, which is worth nothing, you might have a false fraction of some of the banks might have some residual capital which the federal government might be able to recapture. In other words, in the banking system, which is Wall Street system, you have certain things, transactions that are occurring in the banks. These banks' transactions are formally literal, uh, are formally competent. Um, they're, they're meaningful. But the speculations which go on in Wall Street are worthless. So therefore, if we in the United States put to a Glass-Steagall law, 
we would find ourselves in a position we would have to cancel the general banking law of the United States as it stands at this time. We would then have to readjust it by having a federal law, by a federal law, by the Treasury of the United States. The Treasurer of the United States would then be the person who would designate what a legitimate banking operation is and would regulate it as a government agency, whether it's a private bank or a public one. In other words, everything would be kept on the basis, what is it really worth? Right. Now, that would mean that Wall Street would essentially, except for these elements which are, are part of the, uh, the bailout system, but not really the criminal part. Except for that, we would essentially wipe out the great part of the entire Wall Street income in the United States. In other words, we would save a very modest part of the Wall Street banking. We would save those parts which show that they had a legitimate existence as banking institutions, not gambling institutions. The gambling institutions we would cancel. Now, that would mean that you would have, you, if you look at the total income of the United States in terms of dollars, and you took the, these sections, take the section that's called the highly inflationary section, the Wall Street section, you wipe that out, what happened then to the U.S. economy? What happened to the dollar? The dollar would, be, would collapse, in a sense, in total no amount. But the value of the currency of the dollar would increase greatly for the people and the producers. Right? Now, this is, what, this is exactly what, in, say, looking at Glaziev's view, what, that's what Glaziev is saying. If, he said, if we are being pushed as Russians, if we're being pushed to be uh, inflated, by European agencies, all we have to do is cut out our obligation to European agencies and create our own currency system just the way, exactly the same way I've just described it here. Under those circumstances, they would clean their obligations free of the garbage, which means that the European nations that tried to inflate them by, war by financial warfare would be blown out as a result. And that's what Glaziev is up to. All right, we're going to take a little bit of a turn here, and I was hoping, I want to get your thoughts, Lynn, on the water crisis, on the situation, um, looking at both the United States, but then also globally, and specifically taking a top-down view, get your idea of where mankind as a whole has to go to address this water situation. Now, just to review, we know that the crisis in the Western United States is existential. We know that California is facing the worst drought it's had on its own record books by many accounts. And we know that the California food supply, which is critical for the entire nation, is already being massively affected by the current drought situation. We know that Texas, likewise, is threatened with major drought. And as we've emphasized, the insanity and genocide of the fracking policy is dramatically accelerating the crisis in Texas and other regions. But I think it's important to emphasize that the threat is not just limited to the United States. Many nations, many regions have major water crises they're facing. China has a major water issue that they're trying to deal with to support well over a billion people. If you take global estimates, it's believed that three quarters of a billion, 750 million people have no access to clean drinking water currently. Um, something on the range of two and a half billion people have no access to proper sanitation systems, which requires water supply to be uh, effective. And there's projections that by numerous projections that given these current situations with the existing trends, things are projected to get much worse. But something that we've been discussing in the basement and um, want to put on the table here to you today that you've been uh, pushing us to look at is that we can't, it would be suicidal and dangerous just to go by these existing trends as they exist today and have existed so far. 
And there's another factor that literally subsumes the entire planet, the entire water process on the planet, and that's the activity of the sun, what the sun's doing. And we've seen very clearly that evidence over the past few years points very strongly that we're going to a period of overall weaker solar activity and a period of low solar activity that we've actually never experienced in the modern technological age. And we have an array of different forms of evidence that these particular types of solar weakening periods, sometimes called grand minima, uh, induce various types of climactic changes on the globe and different types of changes in different regions. Um, just to highlight a few examples, which are by no means all of the evidence, but just to give a few examples. Um, in the recent couple of years, there's been a study from members of the Chinese Academy of Sciences looking at tree ring records in the Tibet Plateau, in the Tibet region of China, and showing that these periods of grand minima low solar activity correspond to major droughts in that particular region. Um, there's been well documented and discussed studies coming out of Denmark looking at the role of the relationship between low solar activity and how that exposes the Earth system to increased galactic cosmic radiation. And this increase in the galactic cosmic radiation factor becomes an accelerated input into the whole climate system, cloud formation, the global electric circuit, and becomes a larger input in these weak solar periods. Um, additional studies look at the relationship between regional cooling effects and incre increased glaciation like in the North Atlantic region, which has experienced a very tight relationship between cooling and increased ice flow corresponding with lower solar activity. And then uh, there's other evidence where we don't necessarily have a direct understanding of what role solar activity has played per se, but returning to the United States, we have very uh, concerning evidence looking at the West and California and the Southwestern regions, where multiple studies have shown that um, the California in the Southwest over the past century has actually experienced a relatively mild uh, climate situation, mild in terms of the amount of fluctuation, and a relatively wet situation compared to centuries and millennia prior. So there's serious concern that we've kind of been in a very nice anomalous period, but we could return to something much drier and much more dramatic um, very easily. Now, the, so the point of all this is that the sun, along with other factors, obviously play very significant roles in altering the climate conditions globally and do so differently in different regions of the planet, as far as we can tell. And so when we're looking at the issue of the global water crisis, both the immediate crisis as it's hitting us now, but also the longer term needs of mankind as a whole for water supplies, food supplies, etc. This seems to point to the fact that there is no steady state to the system that we can adopt to, that there's no fixed structure to the system that we can just adjust ourselves to. And it seems like this points naturally towards one very specific conclusion, that overall, the only solution that mankind has for the global water crisis is to go to a higher order of control over the system, to go to higher levels of energy flux density, to try and manage and control on a higher level these water flows and even looking to the larger atmospheric system as a whole. And I think that is just the natural conclusion that this evidence is putting on the table right now to our nation and other nations in this crisis. But what I want to ask you is what does this mean for governments? in the context of the current global strategic situation, given these facts, how should nations and governments respond to this situation? Well, there, for everything that happens on this planet and around it, 
you have two things to consider, and they're two different factors entirely. You can have the so-called natural climate tendency, which doesn't exist. <laughs> then you have the role of mankind as a factor in determining the finite, the, the conditions. For example, if we had put through what was called the Nawapa system, and it put it in what it could have been done was John F. Kennedy's period that it was going to happen. If that had happened, we would not have what the conditions in the West today. That is, in terms of all except the main parts of the Western territory, west of the Pacific, are now in a starvation destruction basis. Now we could not fix that problem. If we'd fixed had Nawapa in place before. We would have controlled, as a matter of fact, we would have controlled a water flow within the internal United States, which would be managed by the whole system, which would include the Canadian system at that point. And the Canadian Alaska system is the major source of water. The difference is that the, it, the, the Canadian water doesn't do much, much good to, to humanity. But if you bring it down into the United States, in these territories, it does a lot of good because what the major driver of economy and the benefit of this agricultural system, the benefit is that plant life and other forms of life transform this water received into the breeding of new stocks of life. And so therefore, if you kill off life, especially human life, you destroy the territory, which means, that, in other words, Man, man, what is mankind? Mankind is a unique species. There is no animal species which corresponds to mankind. None. The point is mankind has the ability to create as no other form of life can do. Life, do, life creates. Mankind does not. Mankind creates life only through life. And mankind, as mankind, is the only agency that can, send, can save a planet from self-destruction of this type. So therefore, what's been done to us by the government of the United States, which blocked these kinds of reforms, which is, in other words, our, our people today don't produce. People in the United States don't produce. They don't, they don't, they don't develop. Most of our pe people are parasites. Most living human beings in the United States are live as parasites. And Wall Street is largely to blame for this. So therefore, we do not have productive labor. Hmm? We do not develop the land area. So now we've got ourselves in a mess. Now we have a period where we don't have in the United States presently, we don't have the ability to build an Awapa system. We could have had it before if we'd put it in several decades of past and put it into place, we would have had a, a circulating water system. We would have connected the Canadian system with the American system and the, and the Northern Mexico system. And we would be growing crops in those areas. And every time we were growing crops and putting the water down there to grow crops, the entire area is going to become enriched by life, animal life, plant life, everything. We destroyed that. We created a desert by negligence, by a very evil kind of negligence. We did not develop modern technology. Now, what does that mean? What's power mean? Power means energy flux density per capita, properly applied. If you do not develop, if you, if you go to low, if you go to a green policy, you're killing the human species. The green policy is murdering the United States. The, the green policy must be canceled now, immediately. The minimal step you have to take, no more green policy, no more environmentalist policy. Get rid of it. That doesn't mean making things dirty. It means putting in more energy flux density into the activity of human beings, raising the energy flux density of that intensity, which means people are more productive and creating more kinds of things. It also means we're going to go to much higher energy flux density in terms of power. We're going to go into, into degrees of energy flux density that mankind does not know right now. 
the, the very kind of high energy flux density which we could have had in the 19, early 1970s, which I was involved in at that period. We could have had that. We don't. It was cut back. So the entire green policy, the zero growth policy, the green policy, the stupidity policy, the Wall Street policy, all these things have destroyed the United States because not only because they've killed the means we had before, but because we have failed to do what mankind must do. Mankind is the unique species which with its creative powers increases the energy flux density expressed by man. Remarkable. The difference between a monkey and a monkey and a also a liberal and, and a human being is the man cooks his own food. No other animal but mankind, and mankind is not an animal, cooks his own food. No animal can do that. No animal will dare to do it. Animals are frightened of war, hot fire. They're frightened of power. But what happens when we raise the standard of living by chemistry, by the application of what we call chemistry, by with the thing that's banned today, since the beginning, since the beginning of the 20th century, we have been banning progress in terms of energy flux density. We are now going to mathematics. We don't practice science anymore, we practice mathematics. All these people who are called the geniuses, the, of the toy makers and so forth, they don't produce anything. They're just playing mathematics. They're jerks playing mathematics. <clears throat> so therefore, when, when we cut our mankind off from mankind's natural tendency, to rise to higher energy flux densities, and by the way, more brain power. Very important, more brain power. Obviously, the main brain power supply in the United States is way down these days. <clears throat> you can see by the votes we've getting, been getting lately. <clears throat> so the point is, this is what we're up against. So we don't have the water that we need. All right, what we're going to have to do is this. We're going to have to go to very high energy flux density, thermonuclear power. Our policy has to be thermonuclear power development. And this will be happen in China. It will happen in, it'll happen in other parts of Northern Asia. It will happen in other parts of the world. We're going to thermonuclear power. Not nuclear power, thermonuclear power and hyperthermonuclear power. If we bring down some helium-3 down from the moon, which we could do, and enhance the thermonuclear program, we could produce a quality of thermonuclear power beyond anything possible on Earth today. And if we apply that kind of mechanism, we can solve the problem. What we're going to have to do is this. We're going to have to, we come, well, let me put it this way. We've come to the end of the existing system of the world as we've known it. The transatlantic region is now dead. It can be revived but at this time is dead and rapidly dying at an accelerating rate. If we go into high energy flux density modes, no more green policy, no more fracking, no more of this crap. We go into that policy, we will be able to fight our way, not to coast into glory, but to fight our way into rebuilding our economy, our nation and other nations. We will create with the gift which man's reason has given him, the reason of science, of creative science. We will create the circumstances for ourselves on earth and nearby earth which could never be created by so-called natural services. And that's where we stand. Do we have the guts to say that we're going to change the policy of this government? We're going to cut out the green policy. We're going to go back to high energy flux density. We're going to the kind of technologies we suppressed when we, sh we should have used them instead. Otherwise, in a very short period of time, in the coming years, the ability to feed people in the state of Texas, in the state of California, throughout most of the states, in that region, from the Mississippi to the Pacific. 
the United States itself will die. Of course, that's the intention of the British Empire anyway. So therefore, the question is, do the people of the United States have the brains and will to take the steps using the high technology methods which are, exist on this planet and which can be developed more actively? Use those means as an energy driver to pump water, to pump it just, ac just across the oceans, just, just across into the land area. Pump it. Distribute it. But always make sure the water is going to a place where crops will grow, where seeds will grow, where man will grow. And we're going to have to go into that kind of program. We have to do it now. Because right now, in this coming year, we're now in a situation in the western states of the United States, in this whole belt, where you're going to find out California is going to become desolate. Texas is already becoming desolate. The whole region, yeah, Canada will still have water, but it won't be producing much because it was inside this area of the United States where the water flowed into the United States that the great wealth was created inside the United States. And what is being done now is mass murderous. So Lynn, this is something you actually touched on in the beginning, but uh, it also came up in the New Paradigm show past Wednesday, this past Wednesday. Yeah. And I wanted to put it on the table a little more explicitly because you, I think, made some very provocative comments about the difference between viewing long arcing historical cycles versus event to event to event type history. And I'd like your thoughts on how this conception pertains to a certain reality that's been an ongoing theme of these discussions that you've emphasized, which is the fact that warfare is no longer possible in today's thermonuclear age. And why uh, you say that this points us towards space development as a needed next uh, stage. So I want to quote just a couple sentences from Wednesday that you said, some of your remarks. You said, so when people say that events are shaping history, no, that's not true. History is what shapes events. And the essential idiocy that dominates people in the world today, and that's the essential idiocy that dominates people in the world today, they keep thinking that they are making events. They think that they are making history. They're not making history. History is being made by thousands of years of cycles. And these are then divided into cycles, but they're not simply independent cycles. They have successions in centuries and so forth. And we've gone through this kind of process. And then you go on discussing this, and a bit later you come on to say, towards the end of the show, you say that warfare on this planet can never occur again. That we're now at a point that any attempt to have an effective full-scale warfare would be the extinction of the human species. So therefore, we cannot have that. In this period, now we have a new development. And the question is, will the United States, which is essential, which is essential in one respect, will the United States change its ways? Because we still represent a certain element of the Renaissance, the spirit of the Renaissance. And if we come back with the American idea which is the Renaissance conception, actually the original American idea, then, together with all the other nations, which are coming up, like China, Russia will come up again under these conditions, then the United States will be very tempted to revive this uh, orientation. So if we can avoid a general war, then we can topple all the dirty things that should have been thrown into the garbage. All the cultures that should have been gone into the garbage bin will now be thrown into the garbage bin. And the planet will be dominated by a new trend, a new long-term cycle of mankind. And that new cycle will not be ended 
until we have moved into nearby space. So I thought this was a very uh, provocative and important assessment. And I was hoping you can elaborate on this conception and why you're pointing towards space specifically in this context. Well, first of all, in order to do it, just on the question of power, if we are using thermonuclear capabilities of the type that are available to us now, as a scientific matter, we do this, we automatically are given the power to do things like this. We can, I mean, we have the power, remember, chemistry was shut down beginning the year 1900, where chemistry, science and chemistry were banned. They didn't go away all at once. But under, you know, the British influence, which took over the, much of this planet, and the warfare that was conducted in the name of the same interest, we destroyed the ability to, to get higher technology. We destroyed nations. We destroyed cultures. But the culture destroyed was not just by the, these warfare or so forth. The destruction was systemic. It's what was called a Zeusian phenomenon. Now, there's, a, there's an ancient so-called legendary story about Zeus, who said, who kept people captive, de depressed them, destroyed them, kept them ignorant, stupid, so forth. That's, that is a culture which is, was actually formed as the Roman imperial culture. There were many cases like that along the way. So the fight again between Zeus against Prometheus, right? Mankind is inherently Promethean. When v mankind is Zeusian, he's a degenerate. He goes to becoming a beast and acts like a beast. Uh, anyone who is of that type is a beast. That's what Wall Street is. Wall Street is made up of Zeusians. They don't produce anything. Look at, look at how the, the funds that they have, the debts that they have. There's no worse in there. There's no product there. What does Wall Street produce? A very little bit. And some banks that actually do, do, do some banking for productive banking. But even that gets less and less as a portion of the total banking. Most of the Wall Street income, you should wipe it out tomorrow. It's not, it's not worth anything. Toilet paper is much more valuable than this stuff. So therefore, we, what the problem is, is that we have to understand mankind. Now, there's no reason for warfare in mankind. That is, there's no necessary reason for it. And, there, they, and also, it can be avoided. Because if mankind is intelligent, mankind is not going to engage in warfare. Yes, police actions, or what we call police actions, to regulate good order in society and among nations, yeah, that's fine, that's necessary to educate people, to help them to change their habits from stupid habits to better habits. But if you're inspiring people with the idea of the prospects of progress, not treating them as slaves, then they'll take it. We've come to the point that the only kind of warfare that we could have on this planet now is general thermonuclear warfare. And general thermonuclear warfare among the nations of the world today, leading nations of the world today, would be the extermination of the human species. So we've come to the time, we're now on the edge of the time for crapping out that British Empire forever. We, if we do that, and we bring about a state of peace, that means that there's things we do have to consider. We do have to consider that a, a culture, a human culture, is a human culture. The human individual is able to function competently and no, see their way into reality only by their cultural development. So you need to recognize that cultures must be protected and supported as cultures. Let them evolve the whatever the way they want to evolve. Let them become whatever they want to become. But the human being who's in these cultures has to have the right to have the ability to have access to de self-development. Therefore, the idea that cultures are units of self-development among nations, not against them. Yes, you do need some police regulation. So what? But that doesn't mean warfare. So therefore, warfare cannot be had because today, if you go to a general war, for example, if this idiot, this criminal idiot, called the President of the United States today, were to have his way, we would be in thermonuclear war now. 
and that would be the extinction of the human species. Because if the United States were engaged with full panoply in conducting a war among nations of this planet, you know, like Asia and so forth against North America, if that were to occur, the likely prospect would be the near extinction or total extinction of the human species. So therefore, general warfare is not a possibility for sane people. Anybody who wants general warfare should be put in an insane asylum and not let out. <laughs> Just don't let them out. So therefore, the time has come where we have to settle this matter. And the only way you're going to settle this matter is by setting priorities and standards of priorities, which nations can come to agree. Now, we find a situation, and we have problems all over the world, but let's take the case of Russia and China. There is no intrinsic conflict of this nature between Russia and China. There's a terrible conflict in parts of Europe, like these Ukrainian fascists, these Nazis. They're terrible. They should be given police treatment, and I don't mean they're put in uniform. <laughs> not the, maybe the striped types, but not the, not the other types. <laughs> so the, the point is mankind has come to the point that we have, mankind has an exist, existential intention for existence in the solar system. Not just, uh, we are not, I'm not recommending anybody to go out rolling around loose in space. I don't think it's a good idea. But mankind is capable of developing devices Maybe some people will go out into space on an experimental basis, but mankind in general is not going to go out into space. Mankind is going to send objects into space. For, for example, we have all these uh, asteroids, and we have a number of asteroids out there that can take out the whole human species at any, any time they wa it wants to or gets the chance to do so. Obviously, those things we're going to do something about. We're also going to do something about managing problems inside the solar system. We're going to take minerals and assets and so forth, which are accessible and needed by mankind, we'll use them. We will have device, devices and the vehicles and so forth that can do a lot of this work for us, like robots. We will send robots all over the place. And that will be what mankind will do. But our, our project is to develop, above all, the human mind. Because the human mind is the distinction of human beings from beasts, to develop the powers of the human mind and the instruments which those powers require. That, that has to be now. That, and look at what's happening. There you have Obama. And guess where I suspect he's going? Not to a very nice position of retirement. Possibly to a prison. He would deserve that. It would be perfectly just. He committed great crimes against humanity. It's not enough to impeach him. He should be put in prison. Why? It's a symbol. To let the people know that this was a crime that was committed by him and by some of his predecessors. We're not trying to punish them. We're trying to bring control, reasonable control, available to humanity in all parts of the world. We need a new kind of society which recognizes that mankind has different cultures within it, but these cultures must have some accord and some common purpose, which however they may divide that purpose, it may, must work to a common end. Yes, we're going to go up to the moon. We're going to take some of that helium-3. We're going to collect it. We're going to bring it down. We're going to get an enriched kind of thermonuclear fusion. We're going to do that. But the time for warfare, this is, not, this is not a policy of war of the nation today. There's no reason for it. We've got to get rid of the warfare people, those who want it. We've got to get rid of Wall Street. We've got to get rid of the thieves, the liars, the parasites. We have to create a future for mankind. Our job is not to acquire something. We're all going to die. But then what's the meaning of life? What's the meaning of human life if we're all going to die? Each of us is all going to die. What's the meaning of life? Isn't it what's the outcome 
of that life? What's it the outcome of huma- for humanity in the future? The destiny of the human species inside the solar system? That's the meaning of our lives. We're all going to die. But you, when you think in terms of scientific principles, discovery of great scientific principles, they don't die. But who creates these scientific principles? Mankind, human beings. So the, the instrument dies, but the, what the human being has created for mankind in the universe persists, advances. That's the purpose of mankind, is not to live a life, but to live the kind of life which creates a better universe for mankind. Thank you very much, and uh, I want to thank Ben for joining me tonight. Uh, That's going to bring a conclusion to our broadcast here, and uh, I thank everybody who tuned in with us. Stay tuned. Good night.